Adventure 10 in the Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adventure 10 The Naval Treaty. Part 1. The July which immediately succeeded my marriage was made memorable by three cases of interest, in which I had the privilege of being associated with Sherlock Holmes and of studying his methods. I find them recorded in my notes under the headings of The Adventure of the Second Stain, The Adventure of the Naval Treaty, and The Adventure of the Tired Captain. The first of these, however, deals with interest of such importance, and implicates so many of the first families in the kingdom, that for many years it will be impossible to make it public. No case, however, in which Holmes was engaged has ever illustrated the value of his analytical methods so clearly or has impressed those who were associated with him so deeply. I still retain an almost verbatim report of the interview in which he demonstrated the true facts of the case to Monsieur de Bug of the Paris police, and Fritz von Waldbaum, the well-known specialist of Danzig, both of whom had wasted their energies upon what proved to be side issues. The new century will have come, however, before the story can be safely told. Meanwhile, I pass on to the second on my list, which promised also at one time to be of national importance, and was marked by several incidents which give it a quite unique character. During my school days, I had been intimately associated with a lad named Percy Phelps, who was of much the same age as myself, though he was two classes ahead of me. He was a very brilliant boy, and carried away every prize which the school had to offer finished his exploits by winning a scholarship which sent him on to continue his triumphant career at Cambridge. He was, I remember, extremely well connected, and even when we were all little boys together, we knew that his mother's brother was Lord Holdhurst, the great conservative politician. This gaudy relationship did him little good at school. On the contrary, it seemed rather a piquant thing to us to chevy him about the playground and hit him over the shins with a wicket but it was another thing when he came out into the world. I heard vaguely that his abilities and the influences which he commanded had won him a good position at the Foreign Office, and then he passed completely out of my mind until the following letter recalled his existence. Briar Bray, Woking. My dear Watson, I have no doubt that you can remember Tadpole Phelps, who was in the fifth form when you were in the third. It is possible even that you may have heard that through my uncle's influence I obtained a good appointment at the Foreign Office, and that I was in a situation of trust and honour until a horrible misfortune came suddenly to blast my career. There is no use writing of the details of that dreadful event. In the event of your acceding to my request, it is probable that I shall have to narrate them to you. I have only just recovered from nine weeks of brain fever and am still exceedingly weak. Do you think that you could bring your friend Mr. Holmes down to see me? I should like to have his opinion of the case, though the authorities assure me that nothing more can be done. Do try to bring him down, and as soon as possible. Every minute seems an hour while I live in this state of horrible suspense. Assure him that if I have not asked his advice sooner, it was not because I did not appreciate his talents but because I have been off my head ever since the blow fell. Now I am clear again, though I dare not think of it too much for fear of a relapse. I am still so weak that I have to write, as you see, by dictating. Do try to bring him. Your old schoolfellow, Percy Phelps. There was something that touched me as I read this letter, something pitiable in the reiterated appeals to bring Holmes, so moved was I that even had it been a difficult matter, I should have tried it. But of course I knew well that Holmes loved his art, so that he was ever as ready to bring his aid as his client could be to receive it. My wife agreed with me that not a moment should be lost in laying the matter before him, and so within an hour of breakfast time I found myself back once more in the old rooms in Baker Street. Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing-gown, and working hard over a chemical investigation. 
a large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a bunsen burner and the distilled drops were condensing into a two-litre measure my friend hardly glanced up as i entered and i seeing that his investigation must be of importance seated myself in an armchair and waited he dipped into this bottle or that drawing out a few drops of each with his glass pipette and finally brought a test tube containing a solution over to the table in his right hand he held a slip of litmus paper you come at a crisis watson said he if this paper remains blue all is well if it turns red it means a man's life he dipped it into the test tube and it flushed at once into a dull dirty crimson hmm i thought as much he cried i will be at your service in an instant watson you will find tobacco in the persian slipper he turned to his desk and scribbled off several telegrams which were handed over to the page boy then he threw himself down into the chair opposite and drew up his knees until his fingers clasped round his long thin shins a very commonplace little murder said he you've got something better i fancy you are the stormy petrel of crime watson what is it i handed him the letter which he read with the most concentrated attention it does not tell us very much does it he remarked as he handed it back to me hardly anything and yet the writing is of interest but the writing is not his own precisely it is a woman's a man surely i cried no a woman's and a woman of rare character you see at the commencement of an investigation it is something to know that your client is in close contact with someone who for good or evil has an exceptional nature my interest is already awakened in the case if you are ready we will start at once for woking and see this diplomatist who is in such evil case and the lady to whom he dictates his letter we were fortunate enough to catch an early train at waterloo and in a little under an hour we found ourselves among the fir woods and the heather of woking briarbrae proved to be a large detached house standing in extensive grounds within a few minutes walk of the station on sending in our cards we were shown into an elegantly appointed drawing-room where we were joined in a few minutes by a rather stout man who received us with much hospitality his age may have been nearer forty than thirty but his cheeks were so ruddy and his eyes so merry that he still conveyed the impression of a plump and mischievous boy i am so glad that you've come said he shaking our hands with effusion percy has been inquiring for you all morning ah poor old chap he clings to any straw his father and his mother asked me to see you for the mere mention of the subject is very painful to them we have no details yet observed holmes i perceive that you are not yourself a member of the family our acquaintance looked surprised and then glancing down he began to laugh of course you saw the j h monogram on my locket said he for a moment i thought you had done something clever joseph harrison is my name and as percy is to marry my sister annie i shall at least be a relation by marriage you will find my sister in his room for she has nursed him hand and foot this two months back perhaps we'd better go in at once for i know how impatient he is the chamber in which we were shown was on the same floor as the drawing-room it was furnished partly as a sitting and partly as a bedroom with flowers arranged daintily in every nook and corner a young man very pale and worn was lying upon a sofa near the open window through which came the rich scent of the garden and the balmy summer air a woman was sitting beside him who rose as we entered shall i leave percy she asked he clutched her hand to detain her how are you watson said he cordially i should never have known you under that moustache and i dare say you would not be prepared to swear to me this i presume is your celebrated friend mr sherlock holmes i introduced him in a few words and we both sat down the stout young man had left us but his sister still remained with her hand in that of the invalid she was a striking-looking woman 
a little short and thick for symmetry but with a beautiful olive complexion large dark italian eyes and a wealth of deep black hair her rich tints made the white face of her companion the more worn and haggard by the contrast i won't waste your time said he raising himself upon the sofa i'll plunge into the matter without further preamble i was a happy and successful man mr holmes and on the eve of being married when a sudden and dreadful misfortune wrecked all my prospects in life i was as watson may have told you in the foreign office and through the influences of my uncle lord holdhurst i rose rapidly to a responsible position when my uncle became foreign minister in this administration he gave me several missions of trust and as i always brought them to a successful conclusion he came at last to have the utmost confidence in my ability and tact nearly ten weeks ago to be more accurate on the twenty-third of may he called me into his private room and after complimenting me on the good work which i had done he informed me that he had a new commission of trust for me to execute this said he taking a grey roll of paper from his bureau is the original of that secret treaty between england and italy of which i regret to say some rumours have already got into the public press it is of enormous importance that nothing further should leak out the french or the russian embassy would pay an immense sum to learn the contents of these papers they should not leave my bureau were it not that it is absolutely necessary to have them copied you have a desk in your office yes sir then take the treaty and lock it up there i shall give directions that you may remain behind when the others go so that you may copy it at your leisure without fear of being overlooked when you have finished relock both the original and the draft in the desk and hand them over to me personally to-morrow morning i took the papers and excuse me an instant said holmes were you alone during this conversation absolutely in a large room thirty feet each way in the centre yes about it and speaking low my uncle's voice is always remarkably low i hardly spoke at all thank you said holmes shutting his eyes pray go on i did exactly what he indicated and waited until the other clerks had departed one of them in my room charles goro had some arrears of work to make up so i left him there and went out to dine when i returned he was gone i was anxious to hurry my work for i knew that joseph the mr harrison whom you saw just now was in town and that he would travel down to woking by the eleven o'clock train and i wanted if possible to catch it when i came to re-examine the treaty i saw at once that it was of such importance that my uncle had been guilty of no exaggeration in what he had said without going into details i may say that it defined the position of great britain towards the triple alliance and foreshadowed the policy which this country would pursue in the event of a french fleet gaining a complete ascendancy over that of italy in the mediterranean the questions treated in it were purely naval at the end were the signatures of the high dignitaries who had signed it i glanced my eyes over it and then settled down to make my task of copying it was a long document written in the french language and containing twenty-six separate articles i copied as quickly as i could but at nine o'clock i had only done nine articles and it seemed hopeless for me to attempt to catch my train i was feeling drowsy and stupid partly from my dinner and also from the effects of a long day's work a cup of coffee would clear my brain a commissionaire remains all night in a little lodge at the foot of the stairs and is in the habit of making coffee at his spirit lamp for any of the officials who may be working overtime i rang the bell therefore to summon him to my surprise it was a woman who answered the summons a large coarse-faced elderly woman in an apron she explained 
that she was the commissionaire's wife who did the charring and i gave her the order for the coffee i wrote two more articles and then feeling more drowsy than ever i rose and walked up and down the room to stretch my legs my coffee had not yet come and i wondered what the cause of the delay could be opening the door i started down the corridor to find out there was a straight passage dimly lighted which led from the room in which i had been working and was the only exit from it it ended in a curving staircase with the commissionaire's lodge in the passage at the bottom halfway down this staircase is a small landing with another passage running into it at right angles this second one leads by means of a second small stair to a side door used by servants and also as a shortcut by clerks when coming from charles street here is a rough chart of the place thank you i think that i quite follow you said sherlock holmes it is of the utmost importance that you should notice this point i went down the stairs and into the hall where i found the commissionaire fast asleep in his box with the kettle boiling furiously upon the spirit lamp i took off the kettle and blew out the lamp for the water was spurting over the floor then i put out my hand and was about to shake the man who was still sleeping soundly when a bell over his head rang loudly and he woke with a start mr phelps sir said he looking at me in bewilderment i came down to see if my coffee was ready i was boiling the kettle when i fell asleep sir he looked at me and then up at the still quivering bell with an ever-growing astonishment upon his face if you was here sir then who rang the bell he asked the bell i cried what bell is it it's the bell of the room you were working in a cold hand seemed to close round my heart someone then was in that room where my precious treaty lay upon the table i ran frantically up the stair and along the passage there was no one in the corridors mr holmes there was no one in the room all was exactly as i left it save only that the papers which had been committed to my care had been taken from the desk on which they lay the copy was there and the original was gone holmes sat up in his chair and rubbed his hands i could see that the problem was entirely to his heart pray what did you do then he murmured i recognized in an instant that the thief must have come up the stairs from the side door of course i must have met him if he had come the other way you were satisfied that he could not have been concealed in the room all the time or in the corridor which you have just described as dimly lighted it is absolutely impossible a rat could not conceal himself either in the room or the corridor there is no cover at all thank you pray proceed the commissionaire seeing by my pale face that something was to be feared had followed me upstairs now we both rushed along the corridor and down the steep steps which led to charles street the door at the bottom was closed but unlocked we flung it open and rushed out i can distinctly remember that as we did so there came three chimes from a neighboring clock it was quarter to ten that is of enormous importance said holmes making a note upon his shirt cuff the night was very dark and the thin warm rain was falling there was no one in charles street but a great traffic was going on as usual in whitehall at the extremity we rushed along the pavement bareheaded as we were and at the far corner we found a policeman standing a robbery has been committed i gasped a document of immense value has been stolen from the foreign office has anyone passed this way i've been standing here for a quarter of an hour sir said he only one person has passed during that time a woman tall and elderly with a paisley shawl oh that is only my wife cried the commissionaire has no one else passed no one then it must be the other way that the thief took cried the fellow tugging at my sleeve but i was not satisfied and the attempts which he made to draw me away increased my suspicions which way did the woman go i cried i don't know sir 
i noticed her pass but i had no special reason for watching her she seemed to be in a hurry how long ago was it oh not very many minutes within the last five well it could not be more than five you're only wasting your time sir and every minute now is of importance cried the commissionaire take my word for it that my old woman has nothing to do with it and come down to the other end of the street well if you won't i will and with that he rushed off in the other direction but i was after him in an instant and caught him by the sleeve where do you live said i sixteen ivy lane brixton he answered but don't let yourself be drawn away upon a false scent mr phelps come to the other end of the street and let us see if we can hear of anything nothing was to be lost by following his advice with the policeman we both hurried down but only to find the street full of traffic many people coming and going but all only too eager to get to a place of safety upon so wet a night there was no lounger who could tell us who had passed then we returned to the office and searched the stairs and the passage without result the corridor which led to the room was laid down with a kind of creamy linoleum which shows an impression very easily we examined it very carefully but found no outline of any footmark had it been raining all evening since about seven how is it then that the woman who came into the room about nine left no traces with her muddy boots i am glad you raised that point it occurred to me at the time the charwomen are in the habit of taking off their boots at the commissionaire's office and putting on list slippers that is very clear there were no marks then though the night was a wet one the chain of events is certainly one of extraordinary interest what did you do next we examined the room also there is no possibility of a secret door and the windows are quite thirty feet from the ground both of them were fastened on the inside the carpet prevents any possibility of a trap-door and the ceiling is of the ordinary whitewashed kind i will pledge my life that whoever stole my papers could only have come through the door how about the fireplace they use none there is a stove the bell rope hangs from the wire just to the right of my desk whoever rang it must have come right up to the desk to do it but why should any criminal wish to ring the bell it is a most insoluble mystery certainly the incident was unusual what were your next steps you examined the room i presume to see if the intruder had left any traces any cigar end or dropped glove or hairpin or other trifle there was nothing of the sort no smell well we never thought of that ah a scent of tobacco would have been worth a great deal to us in such an investigation i never smoked myself so i think i should have observed if there had been any smell of tobacco there was absolutely no clue of any kind the only tangible fact was that the commissionaire's wife mrs tangy was the name had hurried out of the place he could give no explanation save that it was about the time when the woman always went home the policeman and i agreed that our best plan would be to seize the woman before she could get rid of the papers presuming that she had them the alarm had reached scotland yard by this time and mr forbes the detective came round at once and took up the case with a great deal of energy we hired a hansom and in half an hour we were at the address which had been given to us a young woman opened the door who proved to be mrs tangy's eldest daughter her mother had not come back yet and we were shown into the front room to wait about ten minutes later a knock came at the door and here we made the one serious mistake for which i blame myself instead of opening the door ourselves we allowed the girl to do so we heard her say mother there are two men in the house waiting to see you and an instant afterwards we heard the patter of feet rushing down the passage forbes flung open the door and we both ran into the back room or kitchen but the woman had got there before us she stared at us with defiant eyes and then suddenly recognizing me an expression of absolute astonishment came over her face 
why if it isn't mr phelps of the office she cried come come who did you think we were when you ran away from us asked my companion oh, i thought you were the brokers said she we have had some trouble with a tradesman that's not quite good enough answered forbes we have reason to believe that you have taken a paper of importance from the foreign office and that you ran in here to dispose of it he must come back with us to scotland yard to be searched it was in vain that she protested and resisted a four-wheeler was brought and we all three drove back in it we had first made an examination of the kitchen and especially of the kitchen fire to see whether she might have made away with the papers during the instant that she was alone there were no signs however of any ashes or scraps when we reached scotland yard she was handed over at once to the female searcher i waited in an agony of suspense until she came back with her report there were no signs of the papers then for the first time the horror of my situation came in its full force hitherto i had been acting and action had numb thought i had been so confident of regaining the treaty at once that i had not dared to think of what would be the consequence if i failed to do so but now there was nothing more to be done and i had leisure to realize my position it was horrible watson there would tell you that i was a nervous sensitive boy at school it is my nature i thought of my uncle and of his colleagues in the cabinet of the shame which i had brought upon him upon myself upon everyone connected with me what though i was the victim of an extraordinary accident no allowance is made for accidents where diplomatic interests are at stake i was ruined shamefully hopelessly ruined i don't know what i did i fancy i must have made a scene i have a dim recollection of a group of officials who crowded round me endeavoring to soothe me one of them drove down with me to waterloo and saw me into the woking train I believe that he would have come all the way had it not been that dr ferrier who lives near me was going down by that very train the doctor most kindly took charge of me and it was well he did so for i had a fit in the station and before we reached home i was practically a raving maniac you can imagine the state of things here when they were roused from their beds by the doctor's ringing and found me in this condition poor annie here and my mother were broken-hearted dr ferrier had just heard enough from the detective at the station to be able to give an idea of what had happened and his story did not mend matters it was evident to all that i was in for a long illness so joseph was bundled out of this cheery bedroom and it was turned into a sick room for me here i have lain mr holmes for over nine weeks unconscious and raving with brain fever if it had not been for mrs harrison here and for the doctor's care i should not be speaking to you now she has nursed me by day and a hired nurse has looked after me by night for in my mad fits i was capable of anything slowly my reason has cleared but it is only during the last three days that my memory has quite returned sometimes i wish that it never had the first thing that i did was to wire to mr forbes who had the case in hand he came out and assures me that though everything has been done no trace of a clue has been discovered the commissionaire and his wife have been examined in every way without any light being thrown upon the matter the suspicions of the police then rested upon young goro who as you may remember stayed over time in the office that night his remaining behind and his french name were really the only two points which could suggest suspicion but as a matter of fact i did not begin work until he had gone and his people are of huguenot extraction but as english in sympathy and tradition as you and i are nothing was found to implicate him in any way and there the matter dropped i turn to you mr holmes as absolutely my last hope if you fail me then my honor as well as my position are forever forfeited the invalid sank back upon his cushions tired out by this long recital 
while his nurse poured him out a glass of some stimulating medicine holmes sat silently with his head thrown back and his eyes closed in an attitude which might seem listless to a stranger but which i knew betokened the most intense self-absorption your statement has been so explicit said he at last that you have really left me very few questions to ask there is one of the very utmost importance however did you tell anyone that you had this special task to perform no one not miss harrison here for example no i had not been back to woking between getting the order and executing the commission and none of your people had by chance been to see you none did any of them know their way about in the office oh yes all of them had been shown over it still of course if you said nothing to anyone about the treaty these inquiries are irrelevant i said nothing do you know anything of the commissionaire nothing except that he is an old soldier what regiment oh i have heard coldstream guards thank you i have no doubt i can get details from forbes the authorities are excellent at amassing facts though they do not always use them to advantage what a lovely thing a rose is he walked past the couch to the open window and held up the drooping stalk of a moss rose looking down at the dainty blend of crimson and green it was a new phase of his character to me for i had never seen him show any keen interest in natural objects there is nothing in which deduction is so necessary as in religion said he leaning with his back against the shutters it can be built up as an exact science by the reasoner our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers all other things our powers our desires our food are all really necessary for our existence in the first instance but this rose is an extra its smell and its color are an embellishment of life not a condition of it it is only goodness which gives extras and so i say again that we have much to hope from the flowers percy phelps and his nurse looked at holmes during this demonstration with surprise and a good deal of disappointment written upon their faces he had fallen into a reverie with the moss rose between his fingers it had lasted some minutes before the young lady broke in upon it do you see any prospect of solving this mystery mr holmes she asked with a touch of asperity in her voice oh the mystery he answered coming back with a start to the realities of life well it would be absurd to deny that the case is a very abstruse and complicated one but i can promise you that i will look into the matter and let you know any points which may strike me do you see any clue you have furnished me with seven but of course i must test them before i can pronounce upon their value you suspect someone i suspect myself what of coming to conclusions too rapidly then go to london and test your conclusions your advice is very excellent miss harrison said holmes rising i think watson we cannot do better do not allow yourself to indulge in false hopes mr phelps the affair is a very tangled one i shall be in a fever until i see you again cried the diplomatist well i'll come out by the same train to-morrow though it's more than likely that my report will be a negative one god bless you for promising to come cried our client it gives me fresh life to know that something is being done by the way i have had a letter from lord holdhurst ha huh. what did he say he was cold but not harsh i dare say my severe illness prevented him from being that he repeated that the matter was of the utmost importance and added that no steps would be taken about my future by which he means of course my dismissal until my health was restored and i had an opportunity of repairing my misfortune well that was reasonable and considerate said holmes come watson for we have a good day's work before us in town mr joseph harrison drove us down to the station and we were soon whirling up in a portsmouth train holmes was sunk in profound thought and hardly opened his mouth until we had passed clapham junction 
it's a very cheery thing to come into london by any of these lines which run high and allow you to look down upon the houses like this i thought he was joking for the view was sordid enough but he soon explained himself look at those big isolated clumps of building rising up above the slates like brick islands in a lead-coloured sea the board schools lighthouses my boy beacons of the future capsules with hundreds of bright little seeds in each out of which will spring the wise better england of the future i suppose that man phelps does not drink i should not think so nor should i but we are bound to take every possibility into account the poor devil has certainly got himself into very deep water and it's a question whether we shall ever be able to get him ashore what did you think of miss harrison a girl of strong character yes but she is a good sort or i'm mistaken she and her brother are the only children of an ironmaster somewhere up northumberland way he got engaged to her when travelling last winter and she came down to be introduced to his people with her brother as escort then came the smash and she stayed on to nurse her lover while brother joseph finding himself pretty snug stayed on too i've been making a few independent inquiries you see but today must be a day of inquiries my practice i began oh if you find your own cases more interesting than mine said holmes with some asperity i was going to say that my practice could get along very well for a day or two since it is the slackest time in the year excellent said he recovering his good humor then we'll look into this matter together i think that we should begin by seeing forbes he can probably tell us all the details we want until we know from what side the case is to be approached you said you had a clue well we have several but we can only test their value by further inquiry the most difficult crime to track is the one which is purposeless now this is not purposeless who is it who profits by it there is the french ambassador there is the russian there is whoever might sell it to either of these and there is lord holdhurst lord holdhurst well it is just conceivable that a statesman might find himself in a position where he was not sorry to have such a document accidentally destroyed not a statesman with the honorable record of lord holdhurst it is a possibility and we cannot afford to disregard it we shall see the noble lord today and find out if he can tell us anything meanwhile i have already set inquiries on foot already yes i sent wires from woking station to every evening paper in london this advertisement will appear in each of them he handed over a sheet torn from a notebook on it was scribbled in pencil ten pounds reward the number of the cab which dropped a fare at or about the door of the foreign office in charles street at quarter to ten in the evening of may twenty third apply two twenty one b baker street you're confident that the thief came in a cab if not there is no harm done but if mr phelps is correct in stating that there is no hiding place either in the room or the corridors then the person must have come from outside if he came from outside on so wet a night and yet left no trace of damp upon the linoleum which was examined within a few minutes of his passing then it is exceeding probable that he came in a cab yes i think that we may safely deduce a cab it sounds plausible that is one of the clues of which i spoke it may lead us to something and then of course there is the bell which is the most distinctive feature of the case why should the bell ring was it the thief who did it out of bravado or was it someone who was with the thief who did it in order to prevent the crime or was it an accident or was it he sank back into the state of intense and silent thought from which he had emerged but it seemed to me accustomed as i was to his every mood that some new possibility had dawned suddenly upon him end of part one of the naval treaty part two of the naval treaty by sir arthur conan doyle 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. It was twenty past three when we reached our terminus, and after a hasty luncheon at the buffet, we pushed on at once to Scotland Yard. Holmes had already wired to Forbes, and we found him waiting to receive us, a small, foxy man with a sharp but by no means amiable expression. He was decidedly frigid in his manner to us, especially when he heard the errand upon which we had come. "'I've heard of your methods before now, Mr. Holmes,' said he tartly. "'You are ready enough to use all the information that the police can lay at your disposal, and then you try to finish the case yourself and bring discredit on them. "'On the contrary,' said Holmes, "'out of my last fifty-three cases my name has only appeared in four, and the police have had all the credit in forty-nine. "'I don't blame you for not knowing this, for you are young and inexperienced, but if you wish to get on in your new duties you will work with me and not against me.' "'I'll be very glad of a hint or two, said the detective, changing his manner. "'I've certainly had no credit from the case so far. "'What steps have you taken? "'Tangy, the commissionaire, has been shadowed. "'He left the guards with a good character, and we can find nothing against him. "'His wife is a bad lot, though. "'I fancy she knows more about this than appears. "'Have you shadowed her? "'We have set one of our women on to her. Mrs. Tangy drinks, and our woman has been with her twice when she was well on, but she could get nothing out of her. I understand that they have brokers in the house. Yes, but they were paid off. Where did the money come from? That was all right. His pension was due. They have not shown any sign of being in funds. What explanation did she give of having answered the bell when Mr. Phelps rang for the coffee? She said that her husband was very tired and she wished to relieve him. Well, certainly that would agree with his being found a little later asleep in his chair. There is nothing against them, then, but the woman's character. Did you ask her why she hurried away that night? Her haste attracted the attention of the police constable. She was later than usual and wanted to get home. Did you point out to her that you and Mr. Phelps, who started at least twenty minutes after her, got home before her? She explains that by the difference between a bus and a hansom. Did she make it clear why, on reaching her house, she ran into the back kitchen? Because she had the money there with which to pay off the brokers. She has at least an answer for everything. Did you ask her whether in leaving she met anyone or saw anyone loitering about Charles Street? She saw no one but the constable. Well, you seem to have cross-examined her pretty thoroughly. What else have you done? The clerk, Goro, has been shadowed all these nine weeks, but without result. We can show nothing against him. Anything else? Well, we have nothing else to go upon. No evidence of any kind. Have you formed a theory about how that bell rang? Well, I must confess that it beats me. It was a cool hand, whoever it was, to go and give the alarm like that. Yes, it was a queer thing to do. Many thanks to you for what you've told me. If I can put the man into your hands, you shall hear from me. Come along, Watson. Where are we going to now? I asked as we left the office. We are now going to interview Lord Holdhurst, the Cabinet Minister and future Premier of England. We were fortunate in finding that Lord Holdhurst was still in his chambers in Downing Street, and on Holmes sending in his card we were instantly shown up. The statesman received us with that old-fashioned courtesy for which he is remarkable, and seated us on the two luxuriant loungers on either side of the fireplace. Standing on the rug between us, with his slight, tall figure, his sharp features, thoughtful face, and curling hair prematurely tinged with grey, he seemed to represent that not-too-common type, a nobleman who is in truth noble. "'Your name is very familiar to me, Mr. Holmes.' said he, smiling, and, of course, I cannot pretend to be ignorant of the object of your visit. There has only been one occurrence in these offices which could call for your attention. In whose interest are you acting, may I ask? In that of Mr. Percy Phelps, answered Holmes. Ah, my unfortunate nephew. You can understand that our kinship makes it the more impossible for me to screen him in any way. 
i fear that the incident must have a very prejudicial effect upon his career but if the document is found ah that of course would be different i had one or two questions which i wish to ask you lord holdhurst i shall be happy to give you any information in my power was it in this room that you gave your instructions as to the copying of the document it was then you could hardly have been overheard it is out of the question did you ever mention to anyone that it was your intention to give anyone the treaty to be copied never you are certain of that absolutely well since you never said so and mr phelps never said so and nobody else knew anything of the matter then the thief's presence in the room was purely accidental he saw his chance and he took it the statesman smiled you take me out of my province there said he holmes considered for a moment there is another very important point which i wish to discuss with you said he you feared as i understand that very grave results might follow from the details of this treaty becoming known a shadow passed over the expressive face of the statesman very grave results indeed and have they occurred not yet if the treaty had reached let us say the french or russian foreign office you would expect to hear of it i should said lord holdhurst with a wry face since nearly ten weeks have elapsed then and nothing has been heard it is not unfair to suppose that for some reason the treaty has not reached them lord holdhurst shrugged his shoulders we can hardly suppose mr holmes that the thief took the treaty in order to frame it and hang it up perhaps he's waiting for a better price if he waits a little longer he will get no price at all the treaty will cease to be secret in a few months that is most important said holmes of course it is a possible supposition that the thief has had a sudden illness an attack of brain fever for example asked the statesman flashing a swift glance at him i did not say so said holmes imperturbably and now lord holdhurst we have already taken up too much of your valuable time and we shall wish you good day every success to your investigation be the criminal who it may answered the nobleman as he bowed us out the door he's a fine fellow said holmes as we came out into whitehall but he has a struggle to keep up his position he is far from rich and has many calls you noticed of course that his boots had been resold now watson i won't detain you from your legitimate work any longer i shall do nothing more today unless i have an answer to my cab advertisement but i shall be extremely obliged to you if you would come down with me to woking tomorrow by the same train which we took yesterday i met him accordingly next morning and we travelled down to woking together he had had no answer to his advertisement he said and no fresh light had been thrown upon the case he had when he so willed it the utter immobility of countenance of a red indian and i could not gather from his appearance whether he was satisfied or not with the position of the case his conversation i remember was about the bertillon system of measurements and he expressed his enthusiastic admiration of the french savant we found our client still under the charge of his devoted nurse but looking considerably better than before he rose from the sofa and greeted us without difficulty when we entered any news he asked eagerly my report as i expected is a negative one said holmes i have seen forbes and i have seen your uncle and i have set one or two trains of inquiry upon foot which may lead to something you have not lost heart then by no means god bless you for saying that cried miss harrison if we keep our courage and our patience the truth must come out we have more to tell you than you have for us said phelps reseating himself upon the couch i hoped you might have something yes we have had an adventure during the night and one which might have proved to be a serious one his expression grew very grave as he spoke and a look of something akin to fear sprang up in his eyes do you know said he that i begin to believe that i am the unconscious centre of some monstrous conspiracy and that my life is aimed at as well as my honour 
ah cried holmes it sounds incredible for i have not as far as i know an enemy in the world yet from last night's experience i can come to no other conclusion pray let me hear it you must know that last night was the very first night that i have ever slept without a nurse in the room i was so much better that i thought i could dispense with one i had a night light burning however well about two in the morning i had sunk into a light sleep when i was suddenly aroused by a slight noise it was like the sound which a mouse makes when it is gnawing a plank and i lay listening to it for some time under the impression that it must come from that cause then it grew louder and suddenly there came from the window a sharp metallic snick i sat up in amazement there could be no doubt what the sounds were now the first ones had been caused by someone forcing an instrument through the slit between the sashes and the second by the catch being pressed back there was a pause then for about ten minutes as if the person were waiting to see whether the noise had awakened me then i heard a gentle creaking as the window was very slowly opened i could stand it no longer for my nerves are not what they used to be i sprang out of bed and flung open the shutters a man was crouching at the window i could see little of him for he was gone like a flash he was wrapped in some sort of cloak which came across the lower part of his face one thing only i am sure of and that is he had some weapon in his hand it looked to me like a long knife i distinctly saw the gleam of it as he turned to run this is most interesting said holmes pray what did you do then i should have followed him through the open window if i had been stronger as it was i rang the bell and roused the house it took me some little time for the bell rings in the kitchen and the servants are all asleep upstairs i shouted however and that brought joseph down and he roused the others joseph and the groom found marks on the bed outside the window but the weather has been so dry lately that they found it hopeless to follow the trail across the grass there's a place however on the wooden fence which skirts the road which shows signs they tell me as if someone had got over and had snapped the top of the rail in doing so i have said nothing to the local police yet for i thought i had best have your opinion first this tale of our clients appeared to have an extraordinary effect upon sherlock holmes he rose from his chair and paced about the room in uncontrollable excitement misfortunes never come single said phelps smiling though it was evident that his adventure had somewhat shaken him you have certainly had your share said holmes do you think you could walk around the house with me oh yes i should like a little sunshine joseph will come too and i also said miss harrison i am afraid not said holmes shaking his head i think i must ask you to remain sitting exactly where you are the young lady resumed her seat with an air of displeasure her brother however had joined us and we set off all four together we passed round the lawn to the outside of the young diplomatist's window there were as he had said marks upon the bed but they were hopelessly blurred and vague holmes stooped over them for an instant and then rose shrugging his shoulders i don't think anyone could make much of this said he let us go round the house and see why this particular room was chosen by the burglar i should have thought those larger windows of the drawing-room and dining-room would have had more attractions for him they are more visible from the road suggested mr joseph harrison ah yes of course there is a door here which he might have attempted what is it for it is a side entrance for tradespeople of course it is locked at night have you ever had an alarm like this before never said our client do you keep plate in the house or anything to attract burglars nothing of value holmes strolled round the house with his hands in his pockets and a negligent air which was unusual with him by the way said he to joseph harrison you found some place i understand where the fellow scaled the fence let us have a look at it the plump young man led us to a spot where the top of one of the wooden rails had been cracked a small fragment of the wood was hanging down holmes pulled it off and examined it critically 
do you think that was done last night it looks rather old does it not well possibly so there are no marks of any one jumping down upon the other side no i fancy we shall get no help here let us go back to the bedroom and talk the matter over percy phelps was walking very slowly leaning upon the arm of his future brother-in-law holmes walked swiftly across the lawn and we were at the open window of the bedroom long before the others came miss harrison said holmes speaking with the utmost intensity of manner you must stay where you are all day let nothing prevent you from staying where you are all day it is of the utmost importance certainly if you wish it mr holmes said the girl in astonishment when you go to bed lock the door of this room on the outside and keep the key promise to do this but percy he will come to london with us and am i to remain here it is for his sake you can serve him quick promise she gave a quick nod of assent just as the other two came up why do you sit moping there annie cried her brother come out into the sunshine no thank you joseph i have a slight headache and this room is deliciously cool and soothing what do you propose now mr holmes asked our client well in investigating this minor affair we must not lose sight of our main inquiry it would be a very great help to me if you would come up to london with us at once well as soon as you conveniently can say in an hour i feel quite strong enough if i can really be of any help the greatest possible perhaps you would like me to stay there tonight i was just going to propose it then if my friend of the night comes to revisit me he will find the bird flown we are all in your hands mr holmes and you must tell us exactly what you would like done perhaps you would prefer that joseph came with us so as to look after me oh no my friend watson is a medical man you know and he'll look after you we'll have our lunch here if you will permit us and then we shall all three set off for town together it was arranged as he suggested though miss harrison excused herself from leaving the bedroom in accordance with holmes's suggestion what the object of my friend's manoeuvres was i could not conceive unless it were to keep the lady away from phelps who rejoiced by his returning health and by the prospect of action lunched with us in the dining-room holmes had a still more startling surprise for us however for after accompanying us down to the station and seeing us into our carriage he calmly announced that he had no intention of leaving woking there are one or two small points which i should desire to clear up before i go said he your absence mr phelps will in some ways rather assist me watson when you reach london you would oblige me by driving at once to baker street with our friend here and remaining with him until i see you again it is fortunate that you are old school fellows as you must have much to talk over mr phelps can have the spare bedroom tonight and i will be with you in time for breakfast for there is a train which will take me into waterloo at eight but how about our investigation in london asked phelps ruefully we can do that tomorrow i think that just at present i can be of more immediate use here you might tell them at briarbrae that i hope to be back tomorrow night cried phelps as we began to move from the platform i hardly expect to go back to briarbrae answered holmes and waved his hand to us cheerily as we shot out from the station phelps and i talked it over on our journey but neither of us could devise a satisfactory reason for this new development i suppose he wants to find out some clue as to the burglary last night if a burglar it was for myself i don't believe it was an ordinary thief what is your own idea then upon my word you may put it down to my weak nerves or not but i believe there is some deep political intrigue going on around me and that for some reason that passes my understanding my life is aimed at by the conspirators it sounds high-flown and absurd but consider the facts why should a thief try to break in at a bedroom window where there could be no hope of any plunder and why should he come with a long knife in his hand you're sure it was not a housebreaker's jimmy oh no it was a knife i saw the flash of the blade quite distinctly but why on earth should you be pursued with such animosity ah that is the question 
well if holmes takes the same view that would account for his action would it not presuming that your theory is correct if he can lay his hands upon the man who threatened you last night he will have gone a long way toward finding who took the naval treaty it is absurd to suppose that you have two enemies one of whom robs you while the other threatens your life but holmes said that he was not going to briarbrae i have known him for some time said i but i never know him to do anything yet without a very good reason and with that our conversation drifted off on to other topics but it was a weary day for me phelps was still weak after his long illness and his misfortune made him querulous and nervous in vain i endeavoured to interest him in afghanistan in india in social questions in anything which might take his mind out of the groove he would always come back to his lost treaty wondering guessing speculating as to what holmes was doing what steps lord holdhurst was taking what news we should have in the morning as the evening wore on his excitement became quite painful you have implicit faith in holmes he asked i have seen him do some remarkable things but he never brought light into anything quite so dark as this oh yes i have known him solve questions which presented fewer clues than yours but not where such large interests are at stake i don't know that to my certain knowledge he has acted on behalf of three of the reigning houses of europe in very vital matters but you know him well watson he is such an inscrutable fellow that i never quite know what to make of him do you think he is hopeful do you think he expects to make a success of it he has said nothing that is a bad sign on the contrary i have noticed that when he is off the trail he generally says so it is when he is on a scent and is not quite absolutely sure yet that it is the right one that he is most taciturn now my dear fellow we can't help matters by making ourselves nervous about them so let me implore you to go to bed and so be fresh for whatever may await us tomorrow i was able at last to persuade my companion to take my advice though i knew from his excited manner that there was not much hope of sleep for him indeed his mood was infectious for i lay tossing half the night myself brooding over this strange problem and inventing a hundred theories each of which was more impossible than the last why had holmes remained at woking why had he asked miss harrison to remain in the sick-room all day why had he been so careful not to inform the people at briarbrae that he intended to remain near them i cudgelled my brains until i fell asleep in the endeavour to find some explanation which would cover all these facts it was seven o'clock when i awoke and i set off at once for phelps's room to find him haggard and spent after a sleepless night his first question was whether holmes had arrived yet he'll be here when he promised said i and not an instant sooner or later and my words were true for shortly after eight a hansom dashed up to the door and our friend got out of it standing in the window we saw that his left hand was swathed in a bandage and that his face was very grim and pale he entered the house but it was some little time before he came upstairs he looks like a beaten man cried phelps i was forced to confess that he was right after all said i the clue of the matter lies probably here in town phelps gave a groan i don't know how it is said he but i had hoped for so much from his return but surely his hand was not tied up like that yesterday what can be the matter you are not wounded holmes i asked as my friend entered the room tut it is only a scratch through my own clumsiness he answered nodding his good mornings to us this case of yours mr phelps is certainly one of the darkest which i have ever investigated i feared that you would find it beyond you it has been a most remarkable experience that bandage tells of adventures said i won't you tell us what has happened after breakfast my dear watson remember that i have breathed thirty miles of surrey air this morning i suppose that there has been no answer from my cabman advertisement well well we cannot expect to score every time the table was all laid and just as i was about to ring mrs hudson entered with the tea and coffee a few minutes later she brought in three covers and we all drew up to the table holmes ravenous i curious and phelps in the gloomiest state of depression mrs hudson has risen to the occasion said holmes uncovering a dish of curried chicken her cuisine is a little limited but she has as good an idea of breakfast as a scotchwoman 
what have you here watson ham and eggs i answered good what are you going to take mr phelps curried fowl or eggs or will you help yourself thank you i can eat nothing said phelps oh come try the dish before you thank you i would really rather not well then said holmes with a mischievous twinkle i suppose that you have no objection to helping me phelps raised the cover and as he did so he uttered a scream and sat there staring with a face as white as the plate upon which he looked across the center of it was lying a little cylinder of blue-gray paper he caught it up devoured it with his eyes and then danced madly about the room pressing it to his bosom and shrieking out in his delight then he fell back into an armchair so limp and exhausted with his own emotions that we had to pour brandy down his throat to keep him from fainting there there said holmes soothing patting him upon the shoulder it was too bad to spring it on you like this but watson here will tell you that i never can resist a touch of the dramatic phelps seized his hand and kissed it god bless you he cried you have saved my honor well my own was at stake you know said holmes i assure you it is just as hateful to me to fail in a case as it can be to you to blunder over a commission phelps thrust away the precious document into the innermost pocket of his coat i have not the heart to interrupt your breakfast any further and yet i am dying to know how you got it and where it was sherlock holmes swallowed a cup of coffee and turned his attention to the ham and eggs then he rose lit his pipe and settled himself down into his chair i'll tell you what i did first and how i came to do it afterwards said he after leaving you at the station i went for a charming walk through some admirable surrey scenery to a pretty little village called ripley where i had my tea at an inn and took the precaution of filling my flask and of putting a paper of sandwiches in my pocket there i remained until evening when i set off for woking again and found myself in the high road outside briarbrae just after sunset well i waited until the road was clear it is never a very frequent one at any time i fancy and then i clambered over the fence into the grounds surely the gate was open ejaculated phelps yes but i have a peculiar taste in these matters i chose the place where the three fir trees stand and behind their screen i got over without the least chance of anyone in the house being able to see me i crouched down among the bushes on the other side and crawled from one to the other witness the disreputable state of my trouser knees until i had reached the clump of rhododendrons just opposite to your bedroom window there i squatted down and awaited developments the blind was not down in your room and i could see miss harrison sitting there reading by the table it was quarter past ten when she closed her book fastened the shutters and retired i heard her shut the door and felt quite sure that she had turned the key in the lock the key ejaculated phelps yes i had given miss harrison instructions to lock the door on the outside and take the key with her when she went to bed she carried out every one of my injunctions to the letter and certainly without her cooperation you would not have that paper in your coat pocket she departed then and the lights went out and i was left squatting in the rhododendron bush the night was fine but still it was a very weary vigil of course it has the sort of excitement about it that the sportsman feels when he lies beside the watercourse and waits for the big game it was very long though almost as long watson as when you and i waited in that deadly room when we looked into the little problem of the speckled band there was a church clock down at woking which struck the quarters and i thought more than once that it had stopped at last however about two in the morning i suddenly heard the gentle sound of a bolt being pushed back and the creaking of a key a moment later the servant's door was opened and mr joseph harrison stepped out into the moonlight joseph ejaculated phelps he was bareheaded but he had a black coat thrown over his shoulder so that he could conceal his face in an instant if there were any alarm he walked on tiptoe under the shadow of the wall and when he reached the window he worked a long bladed knife through the sash and pushed back the catch then he flung open the window and putting his knife through the crack in the shutters 
he thrust the bar up and swung them open from where i lay i had a perfect view of the inside of the room and of every one of his movements he lit the two candles which stood upon the mantelpiece and then he proceeded to turn back the corner of the carpet in the neighborhood of the door presently he stopped and picked out a square piece of board such as is usually left to enable plumbers to get at the joints of the gas pipes this one covered as a matter of fact the t-joint which gives off the pipe which supplies the kitchen underneath out of this hiding place he drew that little cylinder of paper pushed down the board rearranged the carpet blew out the candles and walked straight into my arms as i stood waiting for him outside the window well he has rather more viciousness than i gave him credit for has master joseph he flew at me with his knife and i had to grasp him twice and got a cut over the knuckles before i had the upper hand of him he looked murder out of the only eye he could see with when we had finished but he listened to reason and gave up the papers having got them i let my man go but i wired full particulars to forbes this morning if he is quick enough to catch his bird well and good but if as i shrewdly suspect he finds the nest empty before he gets there why all the better for the government i fancy that lord holthurst for one and mr percy phelps for another would very much rather that the affair never got as far as a police court my god gasped our client do you tell me that during these long ten weeks of agony the stolen papers were within the very room with me all the time so it was and joseph joseph a villain and a thief hmm i'm afraid joseph's character is a rather deeper and more dangerous one than one might judge from his appearance from what i have heard from him this morning i gather that he has lost heavily in dabbling with stocks and that he is ready to do anything on earth to better his fortunes being an absolutely selfish man when a chance presented itself he did not allow either his sister's happiness or your reputation to hold his hand percy phelps sank back in his chair my head whirls said he your words have dazed me the principal difficulty in your case remarked holmes in his didactic fashion lay in the fact there being too much evidence what was vital was overlaid and hidden by what was irrelevant of all the facts which were presented to us we had to pick just those which we deemed to be essential and then piece them together in their order so as to reconstruct this very remarkable chain of events i had already begun to suspect joseph from the fact that you had intended to travel home with him that night and that therefore it was a likely enough thing that he should call for you knowing the foreign office well upon his way when i heard that someone had been so anxious to get into the bedroom in which no one but joseph could have concealed anything you told us in your narrative how you had turned joseph out when you arrived with the doctor my suspicions all changed to certainties especially as the attempt was made on the first night upon which the nurse was absent showing that the intruder was well acquainted with the ways of the house how blind i have been the facts of the case as far as i have worked them out are these this joseph harrison entered the office through the charles street door and knowing his way he walked straight into your room the instant after you left it finding no one there he promptly rang the bell and at the instant that he did so his eyes caught the paper upon the table a glance showed him that chance had put in his way a state document of immense value and in an instant he had thrust it into his pocket and was gone a few minutes elapsed as you remember before the sleepy commissionaire drew your attention to the bell and those were just enough to give the thief time to make his escape he made his way to woking by the first train and having examined his booty and assured himself that it really was of immense value he had concealed it in what he thought was a very safe place with the intention of taking it out again in a day or two and carrying it to the french embassy or wherever he thought that a long price was to be had then came your sudden return he without a moment's warning was bundled out of his room and from that time onward there were always at least two of you there to prevent him from regaining his treasure the situation to him must have been a maddening one but at last he thought he saw his chance 
he tried to steal in but was baffled by your wakefulness you remember that you did not take your usual draught that night i remember i fancy that he had taken steps to make that draught efficacious and that he quite relied upon you being unconscious of course i understood that he would repeat the attempt whenever it could be done with safety your leaving the room gave him the chance he wanted i kept miss harrison in it all day so that he might not anticipate us then having given him the idea that the coast was clear i kept guard as i have described i already knew that the papers were probably in the room but i had no desire to rip up all the planking and skirting in search of them i let him take them therefore from the hiding place and so saved myself an infinity of trouble is there any other point which i can make clear why did he try the window on the first occasion i asked when he might have entered by the door in reaching the door he would have to pass seven bedrooms on the other hand he could get out onto the lawn with ease anything else you do not think asked phelps that he had any murderous intention the knife was only meant as a tool it may be so answered holmes shrugging his shoulders i can only say for certain that mr joseph harrison is a gentleman to whose mercy i should be extremely unwilling to trust end of the naval treaty adventure number 11 in the memoirs of sherlock holmes by sir arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain adventure 11 the final problem it is with a heavy heart that i take up my pen to write these the last words in which i shall ever record the singular gifts by which my friend mr sherlock holmes was distinguished in an incoherent and as i deeply feel an entirely inadequate fashion i have endeavored to give some account of my strange experiences in his company from the chance which first brought us together at the period of the study in scarlet up to the time of his interference in the matter of the naval treaty an interference which had the unquestionable effect of preventing a serious international complication it was my intention to have stopped there and to have said nothing of that event which has created a void in my life which the lapse of two years has done little to fill my hand has been forced however by the recent letters in which colonel james moriarty defends the memory of his brother and i have no choice but to lay the facts before the public exactly as they occurred i alone know the absolute truth of the matter and i am satisfied that the time has come when no good purpose is to be served by its suppression as far as i know there have been only three accounts in the public press that in the journal de genève on may sixth eighteen ninety one the reuters dispatch in the english papers on may seventh and finally the recent letter to which i have alluded of these the first and second were extremely condensed while the last is as i shall now show an absolute perversion of the facts it lies with me to tell for the first time what really took place between professor moriarty and mr sherlock holmes it may be remembered that after my marriage and my subsequent start in private practice the very intimate relations which had existed between holmes and myself became to some extent modified he still came to me from time to time when he desired a companion in his investigation but these occasions grew more and more seldom until i find that in the year eighteen ninety there were only three cases of which i retain any record during the winter of that year and the early spring of eighteen ninety one i saw in the papers that he had been engaged by the french government upon a matter of supreme importance and i received two notes from holmes dated from narbonne and from nimes from which i gathered that his stay in france was likely to be a long one it was with some surprise therefore that i saw him walk into my consulting room upon the evening of april twenty fourth it struck me that he was looking even paler and thinner than usual yes i have been using myself up rather too freely he remarked in answer to my look rather than to my words i have been a little pressed of late have you any objection to my closing your shutters 
The only light in the room came from the lamp upon the table at which I had been reading. Holmes edged his way round the wall, and flinging the shutters together, he bolted them securely. "'You're afraid of something?' I asked. "'Well, I am. Of what? Of air guns.' "'My dear Holmes, what do you mean?' I think that you know me well enough, Watson, to understand that I am by no means a nervous man. At the same time, it is stupidity rather than courage to refuse to recognize danger when it is close upon you. Might I trouble you for a match? He drew in the smoke of his cigarette as if the soothing influence was grateful to him. I must apologize for calling so late, said he, and I must further beg you to be so unconventional as to allow me to leave your house presently by scrambling over your back garden wall but what does it all mean i asked he held out his hand and i saw in the light of the lamp that two of his knuckles were burst and bleeding it is not an airy nothing you see said he smiling on the contrary it is solid enough for a man to break his hand over is mrs watson in she's away upon a visit indeed you are alone quite then it makes it easier for me to propose that you should come away with me for a week to the continent where oh anywhere it's all the same to me there was something very strange in all this it was not holmes's nature to take an aimless holiday and something about his pale worn face told me that his nerves were at their highest tension he saw the question in my eyes, and, putting his fingertips together, and his elbows upon his knees, he explained the situation. "'You have probably never heard of Professor Moriarty,' said he. "'Never.' "'Aye, there's the genius and the wonder of the thing,' he cried. "'The man pervades London, and no one has heard of him. That's what puts him on a pinnacle in the records of crime. I tell you, Watson, in all seriousness, that if I could beat that man, if I could free society of him, I should feel that my own career had reached its summit, and I should be prepared to turn to some more placid line in life. Between ourselves, the recent cases in which I have been of assistance to the royal family of Scandinavia and to the French Republic have left me in such a position that I could continue to live in the quiet fashion which is most congenial to me and to concentrate my attention upon my chemical researches but i could not rest watson i could not sit quiet in my chair if i thought that such a man as professor moriarty were walking the streets of london unchallenged what has he done then his career has been an extraordinary one he is a man of good birth and excellent education endowed by nature with a phenomenal mathematical faculty at the age of twenty-one he wrote a treatise upon the binomial theorem which has had a european vogue on the strength of it he won the mathematical chair at one of our smaller universities and had to all appearances a most brilliant career before him but the man had hereditary tendencies of the most diabolical kind a criminal strain ran in his blood which instead of being modified was increased and rendered infinitely more dangerous by his extraordinary mental powers dark rumors gathered round him in the university town and eventually he was compelled to resign his chair and to come down to london where he set up as an army coach so much is known to the world but what i am telling you now is what i have myself discovered as you are aware watson there is no one who knows the higher criminal world of london so well as i do for years past i have continually been conscious of some power behind the malefactor some deep organizing power which forever stands in the way of the law and throws its shield over the wrongdoer again and again in cases of the most varying sorts forgery cases robberies murders i have felt the presence of this force and i have deduced its action in many of those undiscovered crimes in which i have not been personally consulted for years i have endeavored to break through the veil which shrouded it and at last the time came when i seized my thread and followed it until it led me after a thousand cunning windings 
to ex-professor moriarty of mathematical celebrity he is the napoleon of crime watson he is the organizer of half that is evil of nearly all that is undetected in this great city he is a genius a philosopher an abstract thinker he has a brain of the first order he sits motionless like a spider in the center of its web but that web has a thousand radiations and he knows well every quiver of each of them he does little himself he only plans but his agents are numerous and splendidly organized is there a crime to be done a paper to be abstracted we will say a house to be rifled a man to be removed the word is passed to the professor the matter is organized and carried out the agent may be caught in that case money is found for his bail or his defense but the central power which uses the agent is never caught never so much as suspected this was the organization which i deduced watson and which i devoted my whole energy to exposing and breaking up but the professor was fenced around with safeguards so cunningly devised that do what i would it seemed impossible to get evidence which would convict in a court of law you know my powers my dear watson and yet at the end of three months i was forced to confess that i had at last met an antagonist who was my intellectual equal my horror at his crimes was lost in my admiration at his skill but at last he made a trip only a little little trip but it was more than he could afford when i was so close upon him i had my chance and starting from that point i have woven my net around him until now it is all ready to close in three days that is to say on monday next matters will be ripe and the professor with all the principal members of his gang will be in the hands of the police then will come the greatest criminal trial of the century the clearing up of over forty mysteries and the rope for all of them but if we move at all prematurely you understand they may slip out of our hands even at the last moment now if i could have done this without the knowledge of professor moriarty all would have been well but he was too wily for that he saw every step which i took to draw my toils round him again and again he strove to break away but i as often headed him off i tell you my friend that if a detailed account of that silent contest could be written it would take its place as the most brilliant bit of thrust and parry work in the history of detection never have i risen to such a height and never have i been so hard pressed by an opponent he cut deep and yet i just undercut him this morning the last steps were taken and three days only were wanted to complete the business i was sitting in my room thinking the matter over when the door opened and professor moriarty stood before me my nerves are fairly proof watson but i must confess to a start when i saw the very man who'd been so much in my thoughts standing there on my threshold his appearance was quite familiar to me he is extremely tall and thin his forehead domes out in a white curve and his two eyes are deeply sunken in his head he's clean shaven pale and ascetic looking retaining something of the professor in his features his shoulders are rounded from much study and his face protrudes forward and is forever slowly oscillating from side to side in a curiously reptilian fashion he peered at me with great curiosity in his puckered eyes you have less frontal development than i should have expected said he at last it is a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown the fact is that upon his entrance i had instantly recognized the extreme personal danger in which i lay the only conceivable escape for him lay in silencing my tongue in an instant i had slipped the revolver from the drawer into my pocket and was covering him through the cloth at this remark i drew the weapon out and laid it cocked upon the table he still smiled and blinked but there was something about his eyes which made me feel very glad that i had it there you evidently don't know me said he 
"'On the contrary,' I answered. "'I think it is fairly evident that I do. "'Pray take a chair. "'I can spare you five minutes if you have anything to say.' "'All that I have to say has already crossed your mind,' said he. "'Then possibly my answer has crossed yours,' I replied. "'You stand fast?' "'Absolutely.' He clapped his hand into his pocket, and I raised the pistol from the table. But he merely drew out a memorandum book in which he had scribbled some dates. "'You crossed my path on the 4th of January,' said he. "'On the 23rd you incommoded me. By the middle of February I was seriously inconvenienced by you. At the end of March I was absolutely hampered in my plans and now at the close of april i find myself placed in such a position through your continual persecution that i am in positive danger of losing my liberty the situation is becoming an impossible one have you any suggestion to make i asked you must drop it mr holmes said he swaying his face about you really must you know after monday said i tut tut said he i am quite sure that a man of your intelligence will see that there can be but one outcome to this affair it is necessary that you should withdraw you have worked things in such a fashion that we have only one resource left it has been an intellectual treat to me to see the way in which you have grappled with this affair and i say unaffectedly that it would be a grief to me to be forced to take any extreme measure you smile sir but i assure you that it really would danger is part of my trade i remarked that is not danger said he it is inevitable destruction you stand in the way not merely of an individual but of a mighty organization the full extent of which you with all your cleverness have been unable to realize you must stand clear mr holmes or be trodden under foot i am afraid said i rising that in the pleasure of this conversation i am neglecting business of importance which awaits me elsewhere he rose also and looked at me in silence shaking his head sadly well well said he at last it seems a pity but i have done what i could i know every move of your game you can do nothing before monday it has been a duel between you and me mr holmes you hope to place me in the dock i tell you that i will never stand in the dock you hope to beat me i tell you that you will never beat me if you are clever enough to bring destruction upon me rest assured that i shall do as much to you you have paid me several compliments mr moriarty said i let me pay you one in return when i say that if i were assured of the former eventuality i would in the interests of the public cheerfully accept the latter i can promise you the one but not the other he snarled and so turned his rounded back upon me and went peering and blinking out of the room that was my singular interview with professor moriarty i confess that it left an unpleasant effect upon my mind his soft precise fashion of speech leaves a conviction of sincerity which a mere bully could not produce of course you will say why not take police precautions against him the reason is that i am well convinced that it is from his agents the blow will fall i have the best proofs that it would be so you've already been assaulted my dear watson professor moriarty is not a man who lets the grass grow under his feet i went out about midday to transact some business in oxford street as i passed the corner which leads from bentinck street on to the welbeck street crossing a two-horse van furiously driven whizzed round and was on me like a flash i sprang for the footpath and saved myself by the fraction of a second the van dashed round by marylebone lane and was gone in an instant i kept to the pavement after that watson 
but as i walked down veer street a brick came down from the roof of one of the houses and was shattered to fragments at my feet i called the police and had the place examined there were slates and bricks piled up on the roof preparatory to some repairs and they would have me believe that the wind had toppled over one of these of course i knew better but i could prove nothing i took a cab after that and reached my brother's rooms in pall mall where i spent the day now i have come round to you and on my way i was attacked by a rough with a bludgeon i knocked him down and the police have him in custody but i can tell you with the most absolute confidence that no possible connection will ever be traced between the gentleman upon whose front teeth i have barked my knuckles and the retiring mathematical coach who is i dare say working out problems upon a blackboard ten miles away you will not wonder watson that my first act on entering your rooms was to close your shutters and that i have been compelled to ask your permission to leave the house by some less conspicuous exit than the front door i had often admired my friend's courage but never more than now as he sat quietly checking off a series of incidents which must have combined to make up a day of horror you'll spend the night here i said no my friend you might find me a dangerous guest i have my plans laid and all will be well matters have gone so far now that they can move without my help as far as the arrest goes though my presence is necessary for a conviction it is obvious therefore that i cannot do better than get away for the few days which remain before the police are at liberty to act it would be a great pleasure to me therefore if you would come on to the continent with me the practice is quiet said i and i have an accommodating neighbor i should be glad to come and to start tomorrow morning if necessary oh yes it is most necessary then these are your instructions and i beg my dear watson that you will obey them to the letter for you are now playing a double-handed game with me against the cleverest rogue and the most powerful syndicate of criminals in europe now listen you will dispatch whatever luggage you intend to take by a trusty messenger unaddressed to victoria tonight in the morning you will send for a hansom desiring your man to take neither the first nor the second which may present itself into this hansom you will jump and you will drive to the strand end of the lowther arcade handing the address to the cabman upon a slip of paper with a request that you will not throw it away have your fare ready and the instant that your cab stops dash through the arcade timing yourself to reach the other side at a quarter past nine you will find a small brougham waiting close to the curb driven by a fellow with a heavy black cloak tipped at the collar with red into this you will step and you will reach victoria in time for the continental express where shall i meet you at the station the second first-class carriage from the front will be reserved for us the carriage is our rendezvous then yes it was in vain that i asked holmes to remain for the evening it was evident to me that he thought he might bring trouble to the roof he was under and that that was the motive which impelled him to go with a few hurried words as to our plans for the morrow he rose and came out with me into the garden clambering over the wall which leads into mortimer street and immediately whistling for a hansom in which i heard him drive away in the morning i obeyed holmes's injunction to the letter a hansom was procured with such precaution as would prevent its being one which was placed ready for us and i drove immediately after breakfast to the lowther arcade through which i hurried at the top of my speed a brougham was waiting with a very massive driver wrapped in a dark cloak who the instant that i had stepped in whipped up the horse and rattled off to victoria station on my alighting there he turned the carriage and dashed away again without so much as a look in my direction so far all had gone admirably my luggage was waiting for me and i had no difficulty in finding the carriage which holmes had indicated the less so as it was the only one in the train which was marked engaged my only source of anxiety now 
was the non-appearance of Holmes. The station clock marked only seven minutes from the time when we were due to start. In vain I searched among the groups of travellers and leave-takers for the lithe figure of my friend. There was no sign of him. I spent a few minutes in assisting a venerable Italian priest who was endeavouring to make a porter understand, in his broken English, that his luggage was to be booked through to Paris. Then, having taken another look around, I returned to my carriage, where I found that the porter, in spite of the ticket, had given me my decrepit Italian friend as a travelling companion. It was useless for me to explain to him that his presence was an intrusion, for my Italian was even more limited than his English. So I shrugged my shoulders resignedly, and continued to look out anxiously for my friend. A chill of fear had come over me, as I thought that his absence might mean that some blow had fallen during the night. Already the doors had all been shut, and the whistle blown when— "'My dear Watson,' said a voice, "'you have not even condescended to say good morning.' I turned in uncontrollable astonishment. The aged ecclesiastic had turned his face towards me. For an instant the wrinkles were smoothed away, the nose drew away from the chin, the lower lips ceased to protrude, and the mouth to mumble. The dull eyes regained their fire, the drooping figure expanded. The next the whole frame collapsed again, and Holmes had gone as quickly as he had come. "'Good heavens!' I cried. "'How you startle me!' "'Every precaution is still necessary,' he whispered. "'I have reason to think that they are hot upon our trail. Ah, there is Moriarty himself!' The train had already begun to move as Holmes spoke. Glancing back, I saw a tall man pushing his way furiously through the crowd and waving his hand as if he desired to have the train stopped. It was too late, however, for we were rapidly gathering momentum, and an instant later had shot clear of the station. "'With all our precautions, you see that we have cut it rather fine,' said Holmes, laughing. He rose, and throwing off the black cassock and hat which had formed his disguise, he packed them away in a handbag. "'Have you seen the morning paper, Watson?' "'No.' "'You haven't seen about Baker Street, then?' "'Baker Street?' "'They set fire to our rooms last night. No great harm was done.' "'Good heavens, Holmes! This is intolerable!' "'They must have lost my track completely after their bludgeon man was arrested. Otherwise they could not have imagined that I had returned to my rooms.' They have evidently taken the precaution of watching you, however, and that is what has brought Moriarty to Victoria. You could not have made any slip in coming? I did exactly what you advised. Did you find your brougham? Yes, it was waiting. Did you recognize your coachman? No. It was my brother Mycroft. It is an advantage to get about in such a case without taking a mercenary into your confidence. But we must plan what we are to do about Moriarty now. As this is an express, and as the boat runs in connection with it, I should think we've shaken him off very effectively. My dear Watson, you evidently did not realise my meaning when I said that this man may be taken as being quite on the same intellectual plane as myself. You do not imagine that if I were the pursuer I should allow myself to be baffled by so slight an obstacle. Why, then, should you think so meanly of him? What will he do? What I should do. What would you do, then? Engage a special. But it must be late. By no means. This train stops at Canterbury, and there is always at least a quarter of an hour's delay at the boat. He will catch us there. One would think that we were the criminals. Let us have him arrested on his arrival. It would be to ruin the work of three months. We should get the big fish, but the smaller would dart right and left out of the net. On Monday we should have them all. No, an arrest is inadmissible. What then? We shall get out at Canterbury. And then? Well, then, we must make a cross-country journey to Newhaven, 
and so over to dieppe moriarty will again do what i should do he will get on to paris mark down our luggage and wait for two days at the depot in the meantime we shall treat ourselves to a couple of carpet bags encourage the manufacturers of the countries through which we travel and make our way at our leisure into switzerland via luxembourg and basel at canterbury therefore we alighted only to find that we should have to wait an hour before we could get a train to newhaven i was still looking rather ruefully after the rapidly disappearing luggage van which contained my wardrobe when holmes pulled my sleeve and pointed up the line already you see said he far away from among the kentish woods there rose a thin spray of smoke a minute later a carriage and engine could be seen flying along the open curve which leads to the station we had hardly time to take our place behind a pile of luggage when it passed with a rattle and a roar beating a blast of hot air into our faces there he goes said holmes as we watched the carriage swing and rock over the points there are limits you see to our friend's intelligence it would have been a coup de maître had he deduced what i would deduce and acted accordingly and what would he have done had he overtaken us there cannot be the least doubt that he would have made a murderous attack upon me it is however a game at which two may play the question now is whether we should take a premature lunch here or run our chance of starving before we reach the buffet at newhaven we made our way to brussels that night and spent two days there moving on upon the third day as far as strasbourg on the monday morning holmes had telegraphed to the london police and in the evening we found a reply waiting for us at our hotel holmes tore it open and then with a bitter curse hurled it into the grate i might have known it he groaned he has escaped moriarty they have secured the whole gang with the exception of him he has given them the slip of course when i had left the country there was no one to cope with him but i did think that i had put the game in their hands i think that you had better return to england watson why because you will find me a dangerous companion now this man's occupation is gone he is lost if he returns to london if i read his character right he will devote his whole energies to revenging himself upon me he said as much in our short interview and i fancy that he meant it i should certainly recommend you to return to your practice it was hardly an appeal to be successful with one who was an old campaigner as well as an old friend we sat in the strasbourg salle à manger arguing the question for half an hour but the same night we had resumed our journey and were well on our way to geneva for a charming week we wandered up the valley of the rhone and then branching off at luc we made our way over the gemmy pass still deep in snow and so by way of interlaken to meiringen it was a lovely trip the dainty green of the spring below the virgin white of the winter above but it was clear to me that never for one instant did Holmes forget the shadow which lay across him in the homely alpine villages or in the lonely mountain passes I could tell by his quick glancing eyes and his sharp scrutiny of every face that passed us that he was well convinced that walk where we would we could not walk ourselves clear of the danger which was dogging our footsteps once I remember as we passed over the jemmy and walked along the border of the melancholy Daubensee a large rock which had been dislodged from the ridge upon our right clattered down and roared into the lake behind us in an instant holmes had raced up onto the ridge and standing upon a lofty pinnacle craned his neck in every direction it was in vain that our guide assured him that a fall of stones was a common chance in the springtime at that spot he said nothing but he smiled at me with the air of a man who sees the fulfillment of that which he had expected and yet for all his watchfulness he was never depressed on the contrary i can never recollect having seen him in such exuberant spirits 
again and again he recurred to the fact that if he could be assured that society was freed from professor moriarty he would cheerfully bring his own career to a conclusion i think that i may go as far as to say watson that i have not lived wholly in vain he remarked if my record were closed to-night i could still survey it with equanimity the air of london is the sweeter for my presence in over a thousand cases i am not aware that i have ever used my powers upon the wrong side of late i have been tempted to look into the problems furnished by nature rather than those more superficial ones for which our artificial state of society is responsible your memoirs will draw to an end watson upon the day that i crown my career by the capture or extinction of the most dangerous and capable criminal in europe i shall be brief and yet exact in the little which remains for me to tell it is not a subject on which i would willingly dwell and yet i am conscious that a duty devolves upon me to omit no detail it was on the third of may that we reached the little village of meiringen where we put up at the englischer hof then kept by peter steiler the elder our landlord was an intelligent man and spoke excellent english having served for three years as waiter at the grosvenor hotel in london at his advice on the afternoon of the fourth we set off together with the intention of crossing the hills and spending the night at the hamlet of rosenlaui we had strict injunctions however on no account to pass the falls of reichenbach which are about halfway up the hill without making a small detour to see them it is indeed a fearful place the torrent swollen by the melting snow plunges into a tremendous abyss from which the spray rolls up like the smoke from a burning house the shaft into which the river hurls itself is an immense chasm lined by glistening coal-black rock and narrowing into a creaming boiling pit of incalculable depth which brims over and shoots the stream onward over its jagged lip the long sweep of green water roaring forever down and the thick flickering curtain of spray hissing forever upward turn a man giddy with their constant whirl and clamour we stood near the edge peering down at the gleam of the breaking water far below us against the black rocks and listening to the half human shout which came booming up with the spray out of the abyss the path has been cut halfway round the fall to afford a complete view but it ends abruptly and the traveller has to return as he came we had turned to do so when we saw a swiss lad come running along it with a letter in his hand it bore the mark of the hotel which we had just left and was addressed to me by the landlord it appeared that within a very few minutes of our leaving an english lady had arrived who was in the last stage of consumption she had wintered at davos platz and was journeying now to join her friends at Luzern, when a sudden hemorrhage had overtaken her it was thought that she could hardly live a few hours but it would be a great consolation to her to see an english doctor and if i would only return etc the good steiler assured me in a postscript that he would himself look upon my compliance as a very great favor since the lady absolutely refused to see a swiss physician and he could not but feel that he was incurring a great responsibility the appeal was one which could not be ignored it was impossible to refuse the request of a fellow countrywoman dying in a strange land yet i had my scruples about leaving homes it was finally agreed however that he should retain the young swiss messenger with him as guide and companion while i returned to meiringen my friend would stay some little time at the fall he said and would then walk slowly over the hill to rosenlaui where i was to rejoin him in the evening as i turned away i saw holmes with his back against a rock and his arms folded gazing down at the rush of the waters it was the last that i was ever destined to see of him in this world when i was near the bottom of the descent i looked back it was impossible from that position to see the fall but i could see the curving path which winds over the shoulder of the hill and leads to it 
along this a man was i remember walking very rapidly i could see this black figure clearly outlined against the green behind him i noted him and the energy with which he walked but he passed from my mind again as i hurried on upon my errand it may have been a little over an hour before i reached meiringen old steiler was standing at the porch of his hotel well said i as i came hurrying up i trust that she is no worse a look of surprise passed over his face and at the first quiver of his eyebrows my heart turned to lead in my breast you did not write this i said pulling the letter from my pocket there is no sick englishwoman in the hotel certainly not he cried but it has the hotel mark upon it ha it must have been written by that tall englishman who came in after you had gone he said but i waited for none of the landlord's explanations in a tingle of fear i was already running down the village street and making for the path which i had so lately descended it had taken me an hour to come down for all my efforts two more had passed before i found myself at the fall of reichenbach once more there was holmes alpine stock still leaning against the rock by which i had left him but there was no sign of him and it was in vain that i shouted my only answer was my own voice reverberating in a rolling echo from the cliffs around me it was the sight of that alpine stock which turned me cold and sick he had not gone to rosenlaui then he had remained on that three-foot path with sheer wall on one side and sheer drop on the other until his enemy had overtaken him the young swiss had gone too he had probably been in the pay of moriarty and had left the two men together and then what had happened who was to tell us what had happened then i stood for a moment or two to collect myself for i was dazed with the horror of the thing then i began to think of holmes's own methods and to try to practice them in reading this tragedy it was alas only too easy to do during our conversation we had not gone to the end of the path and the alpine stock marked the place where we had stood the blackish soil is kept forever soft by the incessant drift of spray and a bird would leave its tread upon it two lines of footmarks were clearly marked along the farther end of the path both leading away from me there were none returning a few yards from the end the soil was all ploughed up into a patch of mud and the branches and ferns which fringed the chasm were torn and bedraggled i lay upon my face and peered over with the spray spouting up all around me it had darkened since i left and now i could only see here and there the glistening of moisture upon the black walls and far away down at the end of the shaft the gleam of the broken water i shouted but only the same half-human cry of the fall was borne back to my ears but it was destined that i should after all have a last word of greeting from my friend and comrade i have said that his alpine stock had been left leaning against a rock which jutted onto the path from the top of this boulder the gleam of something bright caught my eye and raising my hand i found that it came from the silver cigarette case which he used to carry as i took it up a small square of paper upon which it had lain fluttered down onto the ground unfolding it i found that it consisted of three pages torn from his notebook and addressed to me it was characteristic of the man that the direction was as precise and the writing as firm and clear as though it had been written in his study my dear watson it said i write these few lines through the courtesy of mr moriarty who awaits my convenience for the final discussion of those questions which lie between us he has been giving me a sketch of the methods by which he avoided the english police and kept himself informed of our movements they certainly confirm the very high opinion which i had formed of his abilities i am pleased to think that i shall be able to free society from any further effects of his presence though i fear that it is at a cost which will give pain to my friends and especially my dear watson to you i have already explained to you however 
that my career had in any case reached its crisis and that no possible conclusion to it could be more congenial to me than this indeed if i may make a full confession to you i was quite convinced that the letter from meiringen was a hoax and i allowed you to depart on that errand under the persuasion that some development of this sort would follow tell inspector patterson that the papers which he needs to convict the gang are in pigeonhole m done up in a blue envelope and inscribed moriarty i made every disposition of my property before leaving england and handed it to my brother mycroft pray give my greetings to mrs watson and believe me to be my dear fellow very sincerely yours sherlock holmes a few words may suffice to tell the little that remains an examination by experts leaves little doubt that a personal contest between the two men ended as it could hardly fail to end in such a situation in their reeling over locked in each other's arms any attempt at recovering the bodies was absolutely hopeless and there deep down in that dreadful cauldron of swirling water and seething foam will lie for all time the most dangerous criminal and the foremost champion of the law of their generation the swiss youth was never found again and there can be no doubt that he was one of the numerous agents whom moriarty kept in his employ as to the gang it will be within the memory of the public how completely the evidence which holmes had accumulated exposed their organization and how heavily the hand of the dead man weighed upon them of their terrible chief few details came out during the proceedings and if i have now been compelled to make a clear statement of his career it is due to those injudicious champions who have endeavored to clear his memory by attacks upon him whom i shall ever regard as the best and the wisest man whom i have ever known end of the final problem and of the memoirs of sherlock holmes by sir arthur conan doyle this librivox recording is in the public domain read by david clark bgdavid.wordpress.com and bgcoffee.net i appreciate your time thank you for listening